If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. When we see pictures in the uh, museums of Cro-Magnon man with big hairy chest, loincloth, uh, bad need of a shave and a haircut, we're looking at what some artist believes that Cro-Magnon man looked like. However, we know that Cro-Magnon man in his skeletal features was very tall. From uh, bony features, it appears that he was heavily muscled. He had a high degree of social order from some of the things that he left us to look at. He kept a lunar calendar. And when he drew pictures of himself, like at the cave at Lascaux Le Chateau in France, he showed himself wearing top hat with a neatly trimmed beard. The women were wearing pantsuits and carrying purses. And Marceline Boulle made note of that, even though he was an evolutionist, all the way back in the 1870s. He said, gee, if we look at Cro-Magnon Man and his cave art at Lascaux Le Chateau, he was a better artist than our modern, at his time, our modern French Impressionist painters. So that Cro-Magnon Man fails every test to be a fossil ape man. I guess the most popular fossil ape man is Donald Johansson's find, Lucy. Discovered back in the 1970s. In 72, Donald Johansson found a knee joint, okay? And that knee joint had an angle, had a 15 degree angle. And Johansson said that because apes never have an angulated knee joint, that this obviously was from a human. But a year later, he found a skeleton, about a 40% complete skeleton, and that skeleton looked what only one could say is ape-like. So he matched the knee joint with the skeleton, and he went around the world and said, I found an ape man. Knee joint is angulated just like an ape. Skeleton looks ape, uh, angulated just like a human. Apes don't have angles, and the skeleton looks exactly like a man. Finally, at the University of Missouri in 1987, somebody asked a question. He said, Dr. Johansson, you found that knee joint a year before you found the skeleton. Now, let me ask you a question. How close to the skeleton did you find the knee joint? And Johansson wouldn't answer him. He said, no, 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 I want an answer on that. How close to the skeleton did you find the knee joint? He found the knee joint 300 feet lower in the ground and a mile and a half further away. Well, that's a tall ape. That doesn't sound like those bones fit together. Let me give you some background information also on angulated knee joints. Did you know that there are several groups of apes that also have angulated knee joints equal to the human angle of 9 degrees? Now, Lucy had an angle of 15 degrees. That doesn't match with a human angle. Also, Dr. Adrian Zillman in 1981, New Scientist magazine, demonstrated that Lucy's skeleton is virtually identical to a green forest pygmy chimpanzee. They don't give you research grant money, however, to find green forest pygmy chimpanzee, so Lucy falls out of the family tree. And we finally come to the point now where there isn't any good candidate for a fossil hominid for the ancestor of man. 1987, Zuckerman's work with uh, multivariate computer analysis and, and measurements on the Australopithecines, various specimens, he came to the conclusion that the Australopithecine is distinct both from man and from the apes. He said Australopithecines is out there by itself and is definitely not on a human pathway. Those are the major proposed ape men that just don't hold up when we look at the evidence. And every time there's something proposed, it's pretty well shot down by the evolutionists themselves. And this is why Zuckerman comes to the, uh, Oxnard comes to the conclusion that if man evolved from an ape-like creature, he did so without leaving a trace of that evidence in the fossil record. Any other questions? First off, you've done a good job of debating against uh, prominent scientific ideas, but you haven't supported your ideas. Oh, okay. Secondly, um, you seem to be kind of boring on the idea of, I think it's called Phalom, the idea in the Bible that all things exist, still exist. And then, Another thing would be, science is an evolution of ideas. Given some things will be disproven, back in the early centuries, we didn't believe, we believed the Earth was the center of the universe and everything rotated around us. And it took a long time for us to find out that that was not true. Existing ideas came, they were disproven, other ones came. It's a building from base up to a point. 
So you're you're basing it on well, this one's been proven wrong, this one's been proven wrong, but you're not supporting your ideas, and also this could be a, an evolution towards that true idea. Yeah. Okay, um, let me just present the positive evidence for creation. Let's look at it from a, a standpoint of biological evolution. There's only two answers, and, and this is one of the cases where you can point to the other uh, belief by default and say if evolution is false, if evolution never could occur, then it only leaves one other possibility, and that's creation. Let me just jump to, I think, what's the most important evidence. Evolution requires that non-life eventually become life. You've got to eventually go from chemicals that have no life and no information to living systems that have tremendous amount of information. It's been estimated that... Uh, uh, human DNA, low estimate, has enough information to fill 2,000 volumes of books, 500 pages each with the smallest readable print. Problem is the second law of thermodynamics as it applies to information theory and the work of Brillwein, Schrodinger, Yockey, and Shannon that show that you can transfer information from one source to another, but mathematically and experimentally you can never generate information from non-information. And heat, energy by itself, is not sufficient to do that. Thaxton, Bradley, and Olson in their book, The Mystery of Life's Origins, based upon experimental evidence, do a calculation to show how much energy would be required to convert a, uh, the proper chemicals given pure, uh, given pure uh, isometric, isomeric uh, combinations of chemicals, and they're dealing with DNA here, okay? So we're looking at just right-handed sugars how much energy would be required to form one mole of DNA with only 4 million nucleotides, and the energy is 30,200,000 kcals, which would vaporize the chemical bonds. Energy is not a replacement for information. If you're going to get an informational system, which every living thing is because of its DNA, then you need information. That's an absolute requirement that's experimentally demonstrated, and the mathematics agrees with the experiments, and the experiments agree with the mathematics. So what it says is that you have to have information to get it in the first place, that you never acquire more information you may transfer from one source to the other. And based upon that, going all the way back to that first cause, I can say that chemicals could never become, non-living chemicals could never become biochemicals. That just doesn't happen. That's not because I say it. The laws of chemistry and physics demonstrate that over and over and over again. Scientists have gone in the laboratory, they've looked at these experiments and said, okay, based upon what I get, I can get some building blocks, but can I get it in a form that would come together? And more importantly, can I get an informational system? That's just not allowed. So if I need information, if I need, forgive me a word, intelligence, then that intelligence has to come from initial cause, from an, ish, an initial intelligence source. Knowing also that I'm not going to increase information, I'm not going to generate information from nothing, I'm not going to go from an E. coli bacteria with 4 million nucleotides to you with 10 billion nucleotides. That's impossible. I can lose information, I can go from human to amoeba, but I can't go back up. So again, I'm looking at the necessity for information, not because I say that or because the Bible says it, but because science of information theory says it. Experimentally, that's what's required. So that would be the thing. The question is, if there is an intelligent source that brought, let's say, all of this into being instantaneously, is there any evidence that that information source, that that creator communicated to me? And I would say yes, and I would use a scientific test to do it. The God of the Bible says that he'll prove that he's God because he'll do what no one else can do. God of the Bible says that he will predict the future with 100% accuracy, no errors. There are over 2,000 fulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament, no false prophecies. When you deal with one man in point time history, the Jewish Messiah, there were over 500 prophecies written, and one man in point time history, Jesus Christ, fulfilled 446 of those prophecies. Dr. Peter Stoner calculated what would be the odds that one man in point time history would fulfill just 11 percent of those 446 prophecies, just 48 of those prophecies, and it came out to a probability of one chance in 10 to the 157th power. Now, the French mathematician, statistician, Emile Burrell has written in several places about what the limit of the natural laws of science are. He says if you get above one chance in 10 to the 50th power, that you have gone beyond the natural laws of science. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. To see the one-hour version of this video, go to yahoovideo.com. Type in the name Larry Wessels.